Hello, everybody. Hello. You are very, very welcome. We're ready to kick off the event. Um, and you're, you're very welcome to Catalyst's annual briefing. My name is Hannah Cummings. I'm a program manager here at Catalyst, and I am going to be your host for this afternoon. I'll be joined by an incredible array of individuals who are all going to share insight with you into Catalyst's bold new vision for how to create opportunity for all and the future of innovation in Northern Ireland. We'll also take a moment during the event to reflect on the economic impact Catalyst support and programs have provided over the past five years. So we'll talk about vision, we'll talk about strategy, and we'll also reflect on what has been achieved to date. Now, the people who will bring that story to life are Elvina Graham, OBE Catalyst Chairperson, our very own CEO, Steve Orr, and economist Maureen O'Reilly, who led research into the Catalyst Impact Report, providing the findings that we'll be sharing with you today. All of you in the space should have a copy of that on your seat, and that is available online now for you to view. Now, those three speakers will take up the first half of the event, after which we'll have a panel discussion with three incredible innovators and entrepreneurs from within the innovation community. Helen McCarthy, CEO of Fion Therapeutics, Emma Pollock, CTO of Fintry, and Maria Diffley, co-founder of Sustain IQ, will all share their journeys into innovation, the successes they've achieved and what they aspire towards, and the challenges they face and obstacles they've met along the way. Now, a small note on housekeeping before we get started. We do have the pleasure today, obviously, of having an in-house audience of circa 80, and we also have online viewers. That does mean that we can and we will record this session. So, without further ado, to open the event, I would love to invite Elvina Graham OBE to the stage to provide an update from the Catalyst Board on the vision for innovation in Northern Ireland. Elvina Graham, please welcome to the stage. Thank you very much, Hannah. And indeed, on behalf of the Catalyst Board, you're very, very welcome here this morning. It's just terrific to see so many people in the room. The stage looks very well, it's just we haven't been able to use it much in, in, uh, in recent times, but it, it's great to see you. And welcome to those of us who are joining us online as well. Um, as Hannah said, we're, we're looking at, you know, what is our five-year strategy? We're launching our new strategy and we're gonna spend some time on the impact report. So that's just looking at the economic impact of what we do here in Catalyst. I think it's quite impressive and hopefully you will too. Um, in terms of the strategy, I'm not gonna go into too much detail because Steve Orr can talk on this for hours, believe me. Um, I just wanna to say to you really that the board has spent a lot of time looking at this strategy and we have ended up now with a strategy on a page, which some might think isn't very much. There's not that many words, but each word has been very carefully thought about. And you know, our, our vision is to be a place where we can have innovation for all. In other words, where we widen participation. And we've just been talking about that. Helen and I this morning doing a couple of interviews with Radio Ulster and, and Radio Foil, talking about how we can broaden our offering here to bring in more women entrepreneurs, where we can bring in more of, from underprivileged or you know, different socioeconomic backgrounds. And that is what our five-year strategy is looking at. So it is about opening innovation and the opportunity, broadening out that opportunity to everyone. Um, we were just talking actually about how, you know, our programs, and if you look at what we do with our Catalyst schools, or you look at what we do with our Generation Innovation, we have very high participation rates from females, you know, up to 60%. And yet, whenever we get through to our CEO Connect or onto Springboard, we only have, well, in the teens of, of percentages of, of women, up to maybe 30% at the most. So there is a bit of work for us to do. We've set some five-year goals around that. You know, so at least we can measure it. And certainly the board will be supporting Steve every step of the way because it's quite a challenge. Having been involved in this sort of stuff for years, you know, it's, it's sometimes you feel progress is incredibly slow. So we do need to set some, some targets and we do need to think about each step along the way. I would say we're just at the start of a journey, but it's a very exciting journey as far as I'm concerned. Catalyst is in good shape. Um, we've come through the pandemic, I think, remarkably well. I'm sure Steve will still talk to you about you know, you as tenants and you as partners, um, how valuable you are, but also how you've stuck with us through the pandemic, which has just been tremendous. 
And, you know, I come back here now and it's very hard to find a car parking space, which tells you all you need to know about people coming back in and about the community growing and that face-to-face -face interaction being important. I'm not going to say any more other than thank you very much for attending and you're very, very welcome. And I'll hand straight back to you. There you go, Hannah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alvina. Um, you know, it's great to hear that there is that incredible support from the board um, for what it sounds like are some pretty ambitious targets for the future of Catalyst and innovation here in Northern Ireland. So the question now arises, how are Catalyst going to make that happen? I am delighted to welcome Steve Orr to the stage to talk about Catalyst's vision and strategy to let you know how they're going to do it. Steve, it's over to you. Morning, everybody. Thank you, Hannah. Um, yeah, you can't do that over Zoom, can you? So before we look forward, I just want to look back briefly because we're very proud of what Whenever I say Catalyst has done over the last 20 years, Catalyst is much more than just these buildings of the people who work for Catalyst. Catalyst is a very broad network and a big network and community of whether the companies who work here are volunteers who give their time to help entrepreneurs or the entrepreneurs who help each other or companies, whether it's professional services firms or big technology companies who all share a similar passion and that is to develop a really vibrant entrepreneurial innovation ecosystem in Northern Ireland. And so it's super to see Sir John McCanny here this morning. Sir John, I don't know where you are, but you're here. There he is. And it was uh, Sir John and Norman Apsley and their original vision for the first 20 years of Catalyst and Queen's University Centre for Electronics, Communications and IT. And you see the strength of the platform that ha that has created now in order for us as we, as we look forward. But one of the things that we wanted to do, and Maureen, we'll see a video from Maureen shortly, was that while we have been providing some support to enable a community to provide its own support for entrepreneurship in Northern Ireland for the last 15 years, we wanted to, the, and the Catalyst Board really wanted to measure, okay, well, what impact has that made? And we're so proud of the results that what we have been able to do together, and that's one of the things that we want to focus on, but there was one headline statistic that was reached last year that I felt some personal massive gratitude for. And if, if you think in 2014, there was only 5 million in venture capital invested in Northern Ireland in 2014, 5 million, right? And last year in 2021, in the second year of a pandemic, there was 100 million invested in venture capital in Northern Ireland. Now, I know there's venture capitals contracting in the, in the US at the minute, but Given the strength of that portfolio that we now have, I'd expect that number to keep rising. I think we've done a lot of the hard work and a lot of the companies who helped you achieve that and a lot of the people are in this room. So it's a, I salute you, um, but let's, let's see that continue to go. Um, and the one thing that was really important to us was instead of, again, Catalyst standing up and taking any kind of credit, it's what would the companies themselves, what would they attribute uh, to the support that the network, that community, the volunteers and everything that we're, we're able to, as a platform to provide in support, what was that able to help? So the other thing we started about three years ago was to just ask this one question, which was what does Northern Ireland need from Catalyst that only Catalyst can do? And we've just spent the last, as Alvina mentioned, it was, there's an awful lot of work, an awful lot of thought that went into what might appear as something that's quite simple was, as, it, as it appears on a page. But there is so much now that is intentional. As we looked at, at celebrating the first 20 years, but we looked at that reorientation of what Northern Ireland needs from Catalyst for the next 20 years. So Catalyst's vision is opportunity for all from world-leading innovation. How can we build on that progress that we've all made? The universities, all of the partners, all the entrepreneurs, all the multinationals here of those last 20 years in order to become much more world-leading status, <clears throat> pardon me, in a few narrow cluster areas, okay? But how can we broaden the access to opportunity within those new industries where we want to uh, become one of the top three in the world so that those opportunities are available not just for the meritocracy, not just for the kids that are good at passing exams, but for, but for everybody? And then how can the impact 
of the innovation that we help to develop, how can that better benefit citizens? How can it ben better benefit um, communities and, and help to solve the problems that exist today that can just make for a more equal society? Now, within that, and what we heard, what came at us so loud and clear was, if you look at the first phase of what we had done, of the co-location of world-class academic research, multinational corporations, um, entrepreneurship, and using the surplus profit that Catalyst, as a non-profit organization, used to help to create that platform, to enable the, the volunteering support and entrepreneurship, what really came at us was, let's build on that entrepreneurship and let's make it easy to innovate. Let's make it easier to innovate. So Catalyst's mission is to make it easy for you to innovate. Whether you're a multinational corporation who wants to develop the next technology breakthrough, which will filter into the products in your product pipeline, whether you're a startup, <clears throat> whether you're a scale-up, whether you're a Northern Irish company that's already trading globally, whether you're an academic researcher who'd love to do something or whether you're a kid furthest from opportunity who would love to get into the space, but it does not feel at the minute as if you belong. <clears throat> That's the work that we're going to do next to make this world much, so much more accessible. <clears throat> so as Elvina mentioned, we have got a lot of stuff that we now need to do. We know where we want to be in five years time to have made a serious dent against this ambition, but I'm just going to highlight four initiatives that are important to what we're about to do next. We want to build on the really strong platform of entrepreneurship and scaling that we've helped to develop over the last 14, 15 years. So we have made some announcements in recent days that we've, we've launched Basecamp Boston. For those companies that have developed really good products, maybe they're making really good initial sales, but their primary sales market is going to be the US. How can we help them to establish a much deeper, high quality network in one geography, in one city, incredible city in the US with networks of experienced entrepreneurs, experienced executives, experienced investors who can help to make that journey so much easier. And then how can we mobilize the diaspora and expert mentors in order to, uh, in order to uh, continue to build on that? So Basecamp Boston is gonna be a big initiative for 2021. We want to expand the entrepreneurship work that we do. And in, but within five years, we want to have a thousand individuals from underrepresented groups participating in Catalyst Innovation Programs, who between them will launch at least 50 products. Now, we don't believe, I don't believe that this is really about the creation of social enterprise products that may or may not be interesting. We think there's huge market value and genuine diversity and identifying new products that can help to solve problems that just have not been and challenges that have not yet had the attention that they deserve. There's huge global potential that will come from that and big companies that can be created from that. But it's not so much about only having a focus on companies getting the unicorn status or beyond 100 million, and we will retain a focus on that, but it's celebrating sustainable businesses, sustainable innovative founders, uh, companies founded by people who maybe don't want to get to 100 million, who just want to have really, really good innovative businesses. And we will support that as a priority going forward as well. This year, we're launching under Adrian Johnston Catalyst's services and in open innovation. So recognizing that so many companies now rec recognize that they can't meet their innovation needs internally alone, how can we make it easier for companies to engage in external models of R&D or innovation. Now, whether it's collaborative research, peer support, uh, or other mechanisms and, and, and signposting to how do you make this really confusing fog that exists of the fragmented innovation ecosystem, how can we just make it simpler? So this year, we're going to work, and Adrian's going to lead on the development of three bids that are going to total about 30 million of collaborative R&D projects that we want to be centered around the needs that you as businesses see today or the needs that civic society can see today. And then how can we help to establish those collaborations that's gonna enable access to those talent pools, whether it's academic researchers, and able to accelerate your access to those resources to be able to get some technology advantage that you wouldn't otherwise get. And the main areas that we're gonna focus on that 
is fintech stroke reg, reg tech, and I'm going to come back to that, um, health and green tech. With also our very successful Northwest CAM project, so that's advanced manufacturing into the life sciences, repeating again in a much more developed and uh, expanded model for the, for the next stage. The last thing that I want to say today is that everybody's probably feeling the pressure of some sort of ESG goals from somebody, and nobody wants to come to work in, in buildings anymore that are energy inefficient. So within the next five years, Catalyst is going to reduce the the, uh, our emissions uh, down by 65% in the next five years. Next week, we're starting uh, a project to install 20,000 square foot of solar panels on the roof of this building uh, of PV. So I'm very proud of, we're not just going to talk about it, we're going to do it, okay? And we're going to get to net zero, uh, but we're making very fast strides very quickly towards that. The last thing I want to talk about, to, to give you an example of how this can all come together, is a story about uh, a project that many of us are working in partnership on at the minute, and it's called GCERT, the Global Centre for Secure Intelligent Regulatory Technologies. The Department for the Economy and the Minister, uh, the, the DFE Minister at the time, launched the 10X Economy Vision paper here this time last year. And on the steps of the day of that launch, myself and Jane Brady, who's now the head of the civil service and the person, who, the chap who wrote the 10X Economy Vision paper said, we need to submit one hell of a big bold plan into the UK government for work in Northern Ireland become world leading. Now, Darren McCarthy, who's the, the CEO of FinTrue, about three years ago had said, we have an unfair advantage here when it comes to regulatory technologies. <clears throat> we need to build CRIT, right? The Center for Regulatory IT. Now, whenever we looked at those other sectors and the other clusters and where the opportunity was, where we could find co coherence really, really quickly, regulatory technologies um, came to the top very, very quickly. Now, we very quickly asked FinTech and I to provide us with the leadership and the direction as an industry-led body for how this could evolve. Now, at the same time, this time last year, we launched a new partnership called Innovation City Belfast. And that's the anchor institutions in, in Belfast. So Belfast City Council, Queen's University, Ulster University, Belfast Harbour and Catalyst. And we, our network was to ultimately, how can we help to win these big national assets here, but then how can we exploit them to the benefit of companies? So this is the first example of how this can come to life. Now, GCERT is an Innovation City Belfast project. And the idea is that we're going to build a UK national laboratory. We still have to win it yet with, uh, with the government, right? but we're going to build a UK national, the UK national laboratory that's split between Belfast and Derry that has a cross-border element with Donegal. Last week, we announced uh, an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding with Donegal Council. Hopefully, we have more announcements to come in the next few weeks about a growth and expansion of that. But then integrating the opportunity around developing serious uh, national body on an all-island basis as well, starts to give the kind of positioning that is going to be critically important that we, but we ultimately will be able to achieve a top three position in the world, and that is the goal. That starts with financial services and then starts to address challenges uh, within regulatory technologies, within health and energy, and just about every other sector, and then the convergence that can come from that. But we can't just wait in order to to try to convince the uh, UK government, we're going to get started with this anyway. Uh, Fintry have already supported, in support of uh, Catalyst co-founders program, are putting their own staff through to, to, to start to explore the opportunity and start to look at what well, could regulatory technologies and the entrepreneurship and the idea generation start to come in other ways. Again, this external models of innovation, and then the bids that I mentioned earlier that we're going to go for, one of those is going to be a biggie on regulatory technology. So we want to start, and we want to start to get some momentum, momentum because what we recognize it can take forever to win those kind of things, and we just can't wait. We need to get going. So the last point that I would say just about that is that the big intention within GCERT is that how can we make the opportunities that are developed within that accessible to all communities here? So it's not just the kids that go to certain schools, and that's the extra work that we're going to do. But then the extra challenges that we identify within that space, how can that benefit citizens, <clears throat> you know, much more broadly. 
So I'm excited about that. We have one heck of a lot of work to do. Um, and it's nowhere near one, but we're going to win that and we will win it. So the last thought I will leave you is this. That Catalyst is a small team, but we have one heck of a network. And it's an incredibly powerful network. And you are that network. So Catalyst is all of us. And we've together, we've made one heck of a dent in entrepreneurship. In Northern Ireland, we've taken one big giant stride. And next, the next giant stride we're going to take is in the innovation and integrating entrepreneurship uh, more widely into that. But it's only together that we're going to be able to do that and pull it off. So I want to thank you for your time today. I want to thank you for everything that you've done and helping to contribute. But these are not catalysts wins or catalyst successes today. These are our wins and our successes because everybody has contributed to this. So I just want to thank you. But I want to say the Everest gets steeper from here on and there's more for us to do. So let's go do it. So thank you very much. <laughs>
um, specifically um, dealt with through the through the survey, who responded to the survey. You know, so even taking that at its maximum, it is suggesting that there is a significant impact and a significant change. Um, and particularly, as I said, those interventions, those early stage scale companies, early stage companies, in terms of what happens next and how they grow. Uh, okay, well, look, thank you to Maureen for that information and that she took time to pre-record that since she couldn't be with us today. Uh, I think the statistics there speak for themselves, um, and it's great to hear that Catalyst interventions are making a significant impact, as Maureen put it in the uh, video, and creating opportunities. Um, what's interesting is that she touched on how... Um, you know, organizations have been taking on more employees. And if you take a look at the impact report there, you'll see specifically that there was a 187% increase in the headcount um, within those organizations that were surveyed. So I think what's exciting to think about is um, where we're going to be, the other side of this vision and strategy everyone has heard about today, given the impact that there has been to date and the ambition that there is for the future. So I look forward to our future annual briefings. Now, as promised, we have a panel discussion now that I think is really going to let us ground that vision and strategy we've heard about today in the reality of what it takes to be an innovator and an entrepreneur by those who are doing it right now. Uh, Helen McCarthy from Fion Therapeutics, Emma Pollock from Fintry, and Maria Diffley from Sustain IQ, Sustain IQ. Please join me on the stage. Well, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, I know you've had some radio interviews and such this morning as well, which I think all went very well. Um, to get us started, I would love to hear from each of you in your own words, a little about you and your current organization. So high level context here, just to get us started. Maria, would you like to kick us off? Sure, um, thanks very much for having me here today. Um, so I'm one of the co-founders of Sustain IQ. Um, we are a software tool that helps companies to measure, monitor and report on all things ESG. Um, we started the business in 2017. Um, we, we got a prototype to market and, and um, started trading in 2018. And we really were at that point then, I guess, of, um, you know, we had traction in the market. We knew we, we needed to scale and grow the business, um, but we just didn't know how. And um, that's where we came into contact with Catalyst as well. Um, we have since um, had, we've raised um, two rounds of funding and um, we've also um, grown our team around us, which is um, uh, exactly what you were talking about earlier in terms of those co-founders who are a wee bit afraid to, to let go of that, their baby and, and bring people on board. But um, we've, we've really grown the business from there. Fabulous, thank you so much. Helen, what about you? How long have you got? <laughs> give us uh, give us the elevator version. The elevator version. Okay. Well, the technology that underpins our company, Fion Therapeutics, was first developed in 2006. Uh, it spanned about 12 years of academic research before we spun the company out in 2017. We are life and health sciences. We develop therapeutic messenger RNA vaccines. And when we spun out in 2017, there were literally no wet lab facilities for incubator space for a company. That is still the case today in Northern Ireland and that is a big, big problem. I know I'm doing elevator, so I'll, I'll progress. Uh, so where we've got to is we did the Invent program in 2017. That was Dara's fault, my chief operating officer, not mine. Um, and he said, do it, Helen, and um, we did it. And then we came into contact with Catalyst. Catalyst then have supported us the whole way through and we just opened 5,000 square feet of premises uh, in Catalyst on Sunday the 8th of May this year. We have a pipeline of six therapeutic uh, messenger RNA vaccines. Sorry, one is prophylactic for COVID. Um, and we have around 15 employees and we typically work externally with a, a lot of um, consultants that have taken products through clinical trials before. That's it in a nutshell. Fabulous, absolutely fabulous. Um, incredible to think that we have entrepreneurs here in the space who have been a big support when it came to came to COVID. So we'll maybe touch on that a little bit more later, Helen. Emma, over to you and Fintry. 
Yeah, so hi everyone and, and thanks for having me this morning. My name is Emma Pollock. I am the Chief Technology Officer at Fintry. Uh, Fintry was established in 2013 around the, the vision of our founder, Dara McCarthy, to create solutions in the, in the regulatory space, um, particularly with a focus on financial crime, know your customer and e-money laundering. Uh, we are involved with Catalyst in the partner program and we also support then a number of the other programs at Catalyst, including Invent, Generation, innovation and uh, co-founders which I, I know Hannah has a particular interest in yes that is the program I'm program manager of we should we um, we won't be shy about it um okay fabulous so uh what's really interesting um you'd think we'd planned it is that we have a nice spread here really of some of those uh focus areas that Steve talked about fintech reg tech sort of health med tech as well which is it's going to be really interesting in the conversation um but next up, what I'd like to understand a little bit more about, obviously we've reflected today on the supports Catalyst have provided and the impact those have had. I think it'd be great to hear from each of you um, what benefit you got. I mean, you know, if we go to you first, Maria, you mentioned there how you just grad, you know, you graduated out of the Springboard program. Um, how has that benefited you or, or what leg up did that give you, if it did at all? Yeah, I suppose for us, um, and I was talking to Neve about this earlier, um, as co-founders, we've always been really um, good at realizing what we're good at and what we're not good at. And that was one of the um, lessons that was hammered home to us during the Springboard program, which was you need to bring around that expertise around you. Don't waste your life trying to be a master of everything. And um, I guess that's really what Springboard did for us. It brought the right people to us to give us the right um, advice and um, look there was times definitely I would say it was about at 10 o'clock in the morning I was thinking about a G&T because our business plan had been pulled apart and put back together again but um, to be honest it was um, the best thing that we ever did was taking part in, in the springboard program. It got us to a point where um, I, I guess often look when you have an idea for a business um, and even when you're approving market traction you still have that imposter syndrome because you, you still feel that you don't know everything you need to know. And I think really what it gave us was that confidence in the business plan and in our strategy going forward. And um, it got us to a point where we were both confident actually to stand up in front of a room of potential investors and say, hey guys, take a punt on us. Um, and uh, in terms of that investment process, it's not anything that I was ever you know, aware of before. I had never been part of that landscape, neither had Liam. So to have people that were able to kind of, you know, lead your hand through that, tell you what you needed to expect from this whole process, um, that was absolutely invaluable and gave us the confidence to, to go through it. Um, and even now, it's great, you know, we, we have such a good relationship with the guys here in Catalyst. Um, I'd often pick up the phone and talk to Paul or whoever as well, you know, for, for advice on who, who do you think can put me in touch um, for, for various different pieces of advice. So it's, it's been brilliant. Well, that's really, really fantastic to hear. And I think that imposter syndrome is something um, many people in the room and indeed online can probably very much relate to. Um, at the end of the day, it sounds like you did all the work. It was just that confidence building piece and that, um, shall we call it, critically rigorous uh, assistance that the, the programme could have provided. So Helen, what about you? You touched on there when you initially spoke, you know, your journey with Catalyst started out with Invent. Um, you're now in, uh, you know, custom built lab space as of the start of this month. What happened for you after Invent to take you on the journey you went on? Well, I think probably, you know, slightly in contrast to uh, Maria, where everything was great and you, you, there was a lot of support here in Catalyst. I'm going to give a more balanced view of this, okay? Quite right. So um, what I would say is that we are the first therapeutic development company here in Catalyst. Now, if you're going to build a messenger RNA vaccine company, um, potentially Cambridge or Boston might be the place to do it. So this wouldn't necessarily be the first choice, but for me, it was always the first choice because I wanted to bring new technology and a new type of business here. So one of the biggest challenges that we've had with the business is trying to make the Northern Ireland community in general understand what a biotech therapeutic development company is. And that means that you will walk into rooms where you'll have people around the table and they'll say, what's your annual turnover? 
Now, that gets a wee bit boring after like the third or fourth time when you've explained to them what a therapeutic biotech company is. So there's value created in the company whenever you go through toxicology and it goes well. There's value that's created with clinical trials. There's also value in the technology itself. So a big part for me with Catalyst, and this is where I have to say they were really good, they didn't necessarily get it at the start. But I sat with Elaine and I sat with Steve and I said, now Steve obviously had, had, had known this. And it's not to say they didn't know it, but the actual implications of this type of company is different. So whenever I did invent, you know, people said, you know, you don't present your data. And I said, well, you know, how are we actually going to raise any money? Because in the biotech sector, you have to prove that it works. And the only way to prove that it works is to do it, for example, in animals or, or things like that. And so we had many long debates about that, but Catalyst listened and they took that on board. And I think that that's very important because I think this is a hugely underdeveloped area in Northern Ireland that we can really maximize, particularly as you mentioned, you know, both universities, which incidentally did very well in life and health sciences in the REF, but we have some great technologies coming through, but there is no place for them to develop those technologies in terms of therapeutics and I mean sort of new medicines, and that's what we have to work on. So for me, Catalyst themselves have been great at listening and also pivoting to understand that you're different and that you don't fit in the same box. And I'm not saying all the other businesses are the same, but this is just so outside of there, and, but not in Cambridge. But if we want to be Cambridge or we want to be the top three in the world, we have to understand how the biotech industry works and how you add value to your company that way. Well, I think, Helen, you know, kudos goes to you there. Like you say, you could have more easily set up somewhere who knew the space or what you, what, what you were doing meant. And um, I think it's testament to you that you stopped and said, well, no, I want this to be a space in Belfast. I want to do this within Northern Ireland. And you're paving the way there then for what can come next, which I imagine hasn't been an easy journey, but you've persevered. And I'm really glad that there has been support there to help you with that. But the main difference here in Catalyst is that they listen. Yeah. So they listen, they want to learn and they want to understand what it takes to move forward to the next level. And you don't always get that in other places that are very stuck and traditional in their way. And, you know, sometimes it's about looking up and, and looking out and seeing what's out there. And I do think, you know, I'll, I'll do the pitch now, but I think if there was a wet lab incubator space here, it would be phenomenal <laughs> for all the fantastic products that are coming through because you can't imagine how much the equipment costs as a, as a, as a young sort of startup and, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds for one piece of equipment that you need to analyze your product. Yeah, it does sound like... Something that's very much needed. So um, if anybody's interested, you heard it here first. Uh, let's get on that. Um, my Emma, I, I do want to hear from you on this as well. Fintry are one of our newer partners. Um, so what benefits are you hoping to get out of that relationship? How have you found that experience so far? And why did you want to become one of our partners? Thanks, Hannah. So I joined Fintry in January of 2021 because there's nothing to spice up your life like changing your job in the middle of a global pandemic. And um, one of the, the first conversations that Dara, our CEO and I had around, um, around what we wanted to do was around where could we partner in the, the, the local ecosystem in the local community. So Fintry is obviously very much you know, a traditional business that is concerned about revenue and profitability and serving our clients. But we also consider ourselves to have a, a broader social purpose around creating high quality employment on the island of Ireland. Um, and when we looked out, Catalyst was an, an obvious answer for us because Fintry is a very young company. We were only established in 2013. We've gone through a massive amount of growth. So just to give a little bit of context, we've doubled, more than doubled since before the pandemic. Um, and those values of partnership and entrepreneur as a, entrepreneurship and innovation are really, really closely aligned between how we view the world uh, in Fintry and, and what Catalyst wants to achieve. So, so there was a natural piece there. Um, in terms of, of benefit from partnership, aside from the obvious 
um, the, the piece that, that Steve talked about earlier about being well connected in the ecosystem. So we've met lots and lots of people through our partnership with Catalyst that, that we maybe wouldn't have, and that's created all kinds of interesting opportunities for us. Um, the core programs that Catalyst runs from an entrepreneurship and scaling perspective aren't just opportunities to give back to the community. They're also opportunities for us to build skills in our employees, to build our employees' networks, and also to build some of those entrepreneurship and innovation skills inside our com company and to drive a culture of entrepreneurship, or as I described it last week that someone really latched onto, we can be selfish and altruistic at the same time. We can receive benefit while we give benefit to others. Uh, one that I probably would really like to call out is, is what we've done with co-founders. So uh, as part of those conversations around GCERT, um, Steve and, and Elaine came down to visit us at Fintru just for Christmas this year. Um, and then we also had a conversation with, with uh, Hannah and Fiona and a few others from Catalyst about what could we really do to start building some of that ecosystem and what could we do to demystify entrepreneurship and also help more people take the step outside because a lot of people kind of think, well, maybe I might want to do that, but I don't really know how. And what we hit on was actually to uh, sponsor some of our Fintry employees to take part in the co-founders program on a no strings attached basis. So we went out to our employees, we said, hey, look, there are five spaces on this co-founders program. The only prerequisite for you to take part in this is that you have to want to do it and you have to commit your time to doing it. We will, from a Fintry perspective, support you if you need some time away from the office in order to do it, or if you need any entrepreneurship, mentorship, or anything inside. Uh, and I was overwhelmed by the response for employees. Um, we will, I am sure, share some of their journeys along the way. I'm delighted to say that of our applicants, we had four go into the main program and those four are all in the finals with their companies. And they all also have chosen to get involved in different areas. And they've all also formed companies with other people who are not Fintry employees. So I'm really, really excited to see what that does. And we've entered that knowing that there's a very real prospect that some of these guys will go out and start up their own companies. And if they do, isn't that awesome? Yeah, I have to say, obviously I can comment on that one. They are doing incredibly. Um, and I think it's a real testament to the culture at Fintry that they've come in and I think really raised the game in some ways because of the commitment that they've been able to give because of the sport, support within Fintry as well. Um, and they're all doing wonderfully. So in two weeks time, we'll see if they are a winner of £10,000 or not. All to play for. Um, but back to kind of the, the sort of vision and strategy in hand today um you know it's heartening to hear that in some ways catalyst has been a positive experience for you all whether that's through programs whether that's sort of through it being a space in which you can get out of your own organizational bubble and network with others or in terms of kind of the um space and you know facilities that they have provided and that they've been able to pivot and listen and grow and develop rather than being a, a fixed kind of monolith of a of an organization um so what i'd like to know given the reflection on the strategy and vision today is how do you see that supporting you with future obstacles even if there's one main future obstacle that you see in your way and how does that align with your own organization so perhaps we'll, we'll go back to you maria if you don't mind yeah i suppose um for us in terms of our own business strategy for the last couple of years um in the middle of a pandemic we thought it was wise to probably um stay within the uk and ireland as a market and um We've, we've done really well there, but our next focus, Steve, is the US. Um, and we have a couple of partnerships with other software companies um, that are launching us into that market very soon. So um, I was delighted to actually hear about that Boston hub and uh, we'll definitely be talking to you about it. Um, yeah, I think for us, I suppose um, there's such strength in that network, um, whether, you know, and, and the fact that it is international. It's not just here in this ecosystem in Northern Ireland. Um, and, um, you know, like it's it's connecting all those dots together, I think. Um, and probably the biggest challenge that we have as well, and, and um, Elvena, you, you, you spoke about it, um, trying to get uh, women into the business um, and encouraging that women in tech piece. Um, I'm absolutely inspired here, you know, that there's, female CTO sitting next to me because it's it's not often that you come across it and 
it's not often that we can try we can actually find the women we want to bring more women into the business it's just that they're not taking those career opportunities so that piece around encouraging that innovation um from grassroots up i think is really important as well I think let's just take a moment to say how fabulous that we have a panel of three incredible women across three amazing sectors, actually. And um, thank you for, for bringing that up, Maria. Um, now, what about you, Helen? What is kind of what what main obstacles do you have coming up? And, you know, in terms of the vision and strategy with Catalyst, that Catalyst have, how do you see that aligning with your organization, if it does? OK, well, first of all, I'd like to say that it's great to have three amazing technologies on the stage, irrespective of whether they're women or men. And, and, and I think that's very important. And I think I'm pleased to see that there are women in the strategy, but it's got to be about the product or the technology or the idea. I think that's first and foremost. The other thing that's really important, I think, in the strategy is the widening participation, um, particularly for people who think that it's not for them and they can't do it. I'm a first generation. Uh, that went that was lucky enough to go to university but I didn't come from an area where you would think you would go to university so I do know what it's like to think that I can't possibly do that and I can't get to where I need to go and um, so I think that's very important and I think we have a responsibility here now in, in Catalyst as one of the tenants and certainly Fion would want to do this is to really encourage experience in our various companies for young people to see what it's all about Certainly at the moment and the whole way through um, my career to date, I've always brought in young people from particular areas into my lab to see what they can do and, and what science and where science can take you and what you can do with it. So I, I think that's very important. And I think there's an opportunity there in this strategy um, to link up with the companies. And, I, and I'm pretty sure I don't speak alone on this. I, I'm sure everybody in the room feels the same way. I, I don't think that opportunity to innovate should be based on how much you're worth. I think if you've got an innovative brain, I think you should have the opportunity to do this irrespective. In terms of our challenge, well, you know, we've got to get our first messenger RNA vaccine through a clinical trial, uh, which we're running through um, the uh, Cancer Medicines Network, um, probably most likely running it out of the, the Royal Marsden uh, and the Christie Hospitals over in Manchester. I think we also need to not be afraid of the opportunities that lie outside, you know, cognizant of the fact that there isn't really a great therapeutic development space here. We want to make that, but we have to use experts outside uh, with the view to train our own staff up to eventually, you know, get them to be able to be in a position where they can make messenger RNA, they can make DNA, they can make the vaccines ready for clinical trials. We currently don't have a GMP manufacturing space for this that is a big problem as well. So that's something that we're really looking at and considering taking that into our own hands. I mean, I can stop or I can go on. It depends what you want, but those are my thoughts in general. Um, and, and I do think that it's important to reflect on what has been achieved, but I think it's more important to set your next goal and to have that mindset of what's next thinking. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, you know, what's really interesting there is you touch on that almost imposter piece again, but also made the point about being a bit of a role model. You know, you can't be what you can't see. And, I'm, you know, if we had more time, I'd love to get into what gave you the tenacity to, to keep going on to, you know, do and achieve what you have achieved and the, the product that you have created and, and what you've done with the company. But we don't. So that's for a conversation afterwards. Um, because I'd like to hear from you, Emma, as well, um, the same question. I, I feel like I'm going to be a bit, a bit boring now and, and echo some of the themes that, that I've heard here. I think, you know, f for me, particularly building a technology team, diversity in all its aspects is, is a significant challenge and how we build that next generation of technologists who do have the best ideas. And I, I truly believe that comes from, you know, diversity of experience and diversity of thought. I think that's a very big challenge. And I, I think also... Um, it, it's much talked about, it, and, and I think it links to this theme of inclusion is, you know, there is a skills gap, the things that we are ambitious to do. We have really, really great people in Northern Ireland, but we have a skills gap, and I think that there, there's more that, that we can all do, and I think Catalyst plays a really important part of that around encouraging people from those underrepresented areas, from socioeconomic backgrounds, to really, you know, see what's possible and understand that it that that it can be for them so I, I really really love this innovation for all inclusive innovation theme 
Yeah. And I mean, Ventry are already doing that in the sense that when you talked about the experience with co-founders, you know, you put your employees forward for that professional development and there was no strings attached there. You allowed and encouraged them to get involved with other teams, mix and get that diversity of thought and um, network and, you know, upskill in that regard as well. So you're already enacting that. Yeah. They're, they're also not all from tech because my other thing is that, you know, in, in Fintry, when we talk about entrepreneurship and innovation, a lot of the guys are like, oh, but that's a tech thing. And I don't know what the answer is. And I've, I spend a lot of time trying to explain that, you know, you don't need to know what the answer is. What you need is a compelling problem. Good products are built from compelling problems that are unsolved. So if you have seen a problem that is not well solved, and you can think of a solution to it, then you you are an innovator, whether it's a technology solution or not. Fabulous. Um, good words to live by. Now, to round us out, uh, I'd love to hear just a quick reflection from each of you um, before we close the event today on what position would you love to see Northern Ireland in and your organisations within that in five years' time? We've been talking about it in five years' time today. So what would that be for each of you? Maria? Um, Professionally, in, in the business um, and in the wider, wider e ecosystem, um, well, the first big challenge for us is to try to get the government here to recognise that sustainability isn't an add-on. It's not something that, you know, is a nice to have. And they can't, you know, talk to other businesses about doing the sustainability piece well and not do it themselves. Um, so... Um, what I'd like to see in, you know, a few years time is that Sustain IQ is heavily ingrained in trying to help uh, public sector, private sector companies here to be the most sustainable companies, to help them to get to net zero, to showcase their social value outside of just having profits. And um, that as a company that we're um, able to infiltrate other markets, showcasing, I, I'd love to, for us to have this as a test bed here in Northern Ireland, because look, if there's one thing I've learned, uh, you, you might have guessed by the accent, I'm not originally from here, I'm a Limerick woman, but um, having lived and, and worked all over the world, I can stand over the fact that Northern Ireland has a fantastic ecosystem for startups. And um, I would like to see that ecosystem um, network take on the sustainability challenge um, and showcase as a best in class here in Northern Ireland. We have so much green tech here that can help with this. My uh, last six to eight weeks has been nonstop conversations with um, public servants and, and um, representatives to try to get them to understand just how many solutions that we have here locally in Northern Ireland that can solve those problems. It's getting that message out there and getting those dots connected. So for me personally, I would love to see us here as a best in class in terms of reaching those sustainable goals um, and for us then to use that to be able to take our tech that we've built here in Northern Ireland for those solutions and um, bring it right across the world. Fantastic. Helen? So I'd like Fion Therapeutics to be a global messenger RNA provider for vaccines because there's no doubt that um, the pandemic and the messenger RNA vaccines we have have just been the starter for 10 um, and that all vaccines will probably end up being messenger RNA driven because of the safety profile of them um, and for numerous other scientific reasons. So I would like us then to become a manufacturing hub for these messenger RNA vaccines. Um, it's pretty iconic really to be back down here for, from my perspective in this area, which once built ships uh, and my grandfather and father were part of that. And uh, we're now building messenger RNA down here, which is, hasn't been lost on me. Um, but I think as well as that, I would really like to see Northern Ireland embrace life and health sciences in the therapeutic sector appropriately. I would like people to understand that it's a great startup space if you are in the areas of med tech, AI, et cetera. But it is not a great startup space if, in your, if you are in the area of trying to build therapeutics. You go over to places such as Alderley Park, such as the Cambridge Bioscience, and it is phenomenal, the ecosystem that they have there. And there is a great ecosystem for, for your technologies and technologies in the room, but we need to work on the ecosystem for therapeutics in life and health sciences because the potential, Steve talked about investment there, and he was really excited that they got to 100 million. The potential of investment into life and health sciences you're talking billions of pounds in that. And you're talking about companies that are going to be worth 
billions of pounds as well. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity here to understand that is a different type of model. It's not the same, but that doesn't mean that it's any less effective and it could have actually quite a lot of impact. The other thing I'd really like people to do uh, in the room, and we all do this in the room anyway, but also spread the message to just be open-minded about everything and don't have a closed mind in anything that you do. Fantastic, thank you so much. And Emma? Yeah, so um, from, from a Fintry perspective, our, um, our, our ambition, I think, mirrors, mirrors you guys. Look, we are a Northern Ireland established company, but we, we serve our clients globally. We are rapidly becoming a, a global company in the next five years. We, we will be located in significantly in other countries outside of Northern Ireland, but, but still headquartered here. And our actual vision is a, is a 2030 vision to become one of the leading providers of reg tech solutions across both technology and services by 2030. And we are significantly investing in R&D to move towards that goal. Um, more broadly, from a, a Northern Ireland perspective and a catalyst perspective, the conversation we've had with Steve and the team here is that we would like to see that 100 million number in terms of investment in Northern Ireland grown companies go up um, and that we would like to see 10 unicorns Northern Ireland founded companies as a real sign that all of this has come to fruition and that we've really really reached the ambition and the potential that we believe Northern Ireland has. Well I think if all this transpires and I don't mean this glibly at all Northern Ireland's going to take over the world and quite right. Um, Folks, that brings us to the end of our event. Thank you to each of you for your contributions there. Um, I'm sure the perspectives you shared are perspectives that many of you in the audience share and as well as our online viewers. Um, I'm sure that they have really resonated this morning. But of course we are at an end. So thanks also go to Alvina, uh, Maureen and Steve for the insights they shared earlier and also for the work that's gone into creating that vision and that strategy. And thanks go to those people who have been involved in creating that vision and strategy as well and the work that's been put in to create the Catalyst Impact to date. I think the key takeaway message from today um, after hearing from everybody speak is that the vision and strategy outlined for Northern Ireland is not something that can be achieved by anyone in isolation. Catalyst exists because of and for the ecosystem. Um, and if it weren't for you, you know, we wouldn't exist either. So thanks also go to all those people who have helped Catalyst do what they do, the volunteers, the mentors, the organizations and individuals within the wider ecosystem who are also aligned with this similar agenda. Um, and together we are gonna make this happen. So of course, if you do want to know more about how you can get involved, if you want to get involved more with Catalyst, do just please reach out. To our online viewers, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. To those in the space, the same goes to you. And please do feel free to grab another coffee and carry on the conversation. Thank you.